as an outreach program or outreach band, as we hear about later at the University of Illinois. I didn't realize that they were providing opportunities for us to key into exciting new concepts and research areas in physics through their outreach of the University of Illinois. To me, this is a very significant development on the part of education in this state, and I welcome it. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about our speaker, which is not in the abstract that you may have in front of you. Paul Hobart uh, began his undergraduate years, am I right, at uh, Cambridge University in University in uh, Great Britain. And then he had difficulty deciding whether he was on that side of Atlantic or this. He came home to UCLA for his master's degree in physics and went back to England with Imperial College London for his PhD in physics. Now he landed in Urbana, teaching at the University of Illinois, but also sharing time with the University of Göttingen in Germany. Uh, I could not count on fingers of both hands the number of awards that he's had for research, including the uh, presidential awards for an uh, outstanding young investigator from 91 to 96, and the AT&T uh, award, the Xerox award, and other award for research. So uh, the accolades accorded this particular act active researcher are significant. I'm very much looking forward to learning about liquid crystals through his discussion this afternoon. And welcome Paul Goldbart to this campus. introduction. It's a pleasure to be here at this beautiful campus. Uh, it's really quite delightful to be here down by the river and with hills, two things that we don't have much of in Champaign or Urbana. <laughs> what I'd like to do today is to tell you a little bit about liquid crystals and to show you that these are strange fluids that don't always flow. This is research, uh, this is uh, not research at all, this is background to research, uh, some of which has been done in our materials research laboratory at the University of Illinois uh, and in our physics uh, department and it's been generously supported over several years by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Now, let me begin with an outline. Here's my outline. I'll begin with a few words describing the aim of my talk and then what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about what liquid crystals actually are. I'll tell you something of their basic properties and a few words about applications, and then I'll conclude with a small number of resources which you might be able to use uh, to gain uh, further information about this lovely uh, subject. And the chief source for my talk today is a delightful little book by Peter Collins called Liquid Crystal in Nature's Delicate Phase of Matter, 1095 in its paperback, and uh, uh, an absolutely splendid book I wish I'd written it myself. So let me begin by telling you the aim of my talk, and it's really very brief. As you all very well know, applications of liquid crystalline materials are really becoming more and more prevalent throughout many aspects of modern technology. What I'd like to do today is to uh, remind you that provided you know a little bit about what liquid crystals are and how and why they behave in various physical circumstances, you can gain a very clear understanding of why it is that they are useful. And also at the same time, you can use the, the context of liquid crystals to provide students uh, with a very um, pleasant and interesting uh, introduction to a number of fascinating aspects of physics. So that's the basic aim of my talk today. Let me begin by showing you very quickly something that we'll come back to in detail later on. And it's a schematic of a liquid crystal display in what's called the twisted pneumatic mode. Uh, let me highlight the various elements. The workhorse in this system is liquid crystalline material contained in this cavity here. On the top we have a polarizer and on the bottom we have a polarizer and above and below the polarizers are a pair of transparent electrodes and the whole device is used by observing, typically from above, although sometimes in transmission mode. And what I'd like to do is show you how a large number of uh, basic physical ideas come into play when understanding how one of these uh, uh, liquid crystal displays actually works. So that's my mission, to take this thing apart, to talk about the basic physics, and at the end of the day, to see how it is that all of those elements come together 
to make a wonderful and important and very useful device. That's my mission. Let me begin by telling you what liquid crystals are not, by reminding you about some traditional states of matter. So let's begin with the uh, very well understood trilogy of solid liquids and gases. And let's imagine we have some container depicted here. And let's suppose that container is maintained at a rather high temperature. And let's suppose that it contains some molecules. And as you know, for much of their time, the molecules barely know one another. Uh, about one another, and they vigorously move around this container, colliding uh, off the walls, and if we didn't have a lid on top of the container, we'd very rapidly lose all the molecules, or most of the molecules, sitting in the container. The reason for this behavior, as you all well know, is that at high temperatures, entropy is rather more important than energy, relatively speaking, and the entropy of the motion of this system dominates, and therefore the system is quite prepared to give up possible uh, attractive interactions between the molecules in order to uh, take advantage of the great translational freedom available to it as it explores its container. For that reason, the system exhibits the so-called gaseous state of matter. If we now imagine cooling the system down, moving, moving along this axis, and we'll see many more axes rather like this as the talk progresses, what typically happens is the system condenses from a gas into a liquid. And here's a depiction of it's somewhat denser, often very significantly <coughs> denser. The molecules now move around in random thermal diffusive motion, scattering off one another and off the walls of the container. And what they've done is they've said, well, we'll stick together in this collection here. We'll condense. Because if we do that, although we give up lots of translational entropy associated with possible motions of ours, what we'll gain is the fact that we'll stick nearby one another for larger fractions times and we rather attract one another at least at moderate distances and so we'll be able to take advantage of energy and seeing as we're cooling the system down at lower temperatures energy is relatively speaking uh, more and more important and the system undergoes a phase transition from the gas to the liquid state. Now typically as you also know if we cool such a system down a little further it may go through another transition to a qualitatively new phase, a solid phase in which the atoms uh, essentially find a preferred position about which they execute jiggling, fluctuating thermal motion. And as you all very well know, the qualitative properties of this solid phase are quite different from the liquid phase. In particular, the system is resistant to shear. If we try and distort the system, no matter how long we wait, there will always be a restoring stress. <clears throat> so this is the familiar gas, liquid, solid behavior of many, many systems uh, that we're all familiar with. We can say that the kind of phase or the type of phase that the system exhibits is really a measure of the order shown by the atoms or molecules. At high temperatures, the system is rather more disordered, and at low temperatures, it's much more ordered. And in a sense, the liquid can be regarded as an intermediate state between the two. So we have a classification of solid, liquid, and gas according to the amount of water displayed. Now it turns out that this classification is uh, very, very widely applicable, particularly to systems composed of molecules which are, roughly speaking, spherical. The molecules that don't depart too much from a roughly spherical shape, such as, for example, water or alcohol or even mercury. What we're about to see, though, is if we take uh, molecules that are very much non-spherical, rather elongated, then it turns out that this uh, solid liquid gas behavior can be intercepted by other phases of matter, and these are phases of matter that we call, that we call liquid crystalline phases of matter. So now I've tried to show you what liquid crystals are. Let me show you, roughly speaking, what liquid crystals are. What we're going to do now is consider molecules that are rather anisotropic. And here's a rather well-known example. It typically goes by the name of PAA, PA-doxyanisole. And it's a moderately complicated molecule, like left off with a hydrogen atom sitting uh, around the edge. And it has an anisotropy of something like a ratio of four in the length to roughly one in the cross-section. So that's a pretty anisotropic object. For our purposes, we should think of it as something like a cigar. And it turns out that when matter is composed of molecules that have this rather anisotropic shape, 
such matter can exhibit a far richer spectrum of equilibrium phases than just the usual gas liquid and solid, it can in addition show a broad variety of so-called liquid crystalline phases in which there is order somewhat intermediate between uh, liquids and solids. So what I want to do now is show you a little bit about the kind of liquid crystal phases that one might anticipate. Before I do that, I just want to mention that my interest in, in this subject goes back quite a long way, something like 20 years, to uh, went to uh, my birthday in 1971 when I received a Guinness Book of Records to discover in it this picture of uh, a gentleman who I suspect is no longer with us, although I always forget. <laughs> Simon Argovich, as he at the time was the only man able to master the esoteric art of smoking 12 full size cigars simultaneously. Now, the message that I realized at the time and kept with me is that as you can see from this picture here, if you take rather anisotropic molecules and you condense them and squeeze them into a restricted space, they really have quite a strong tendency to line up with one another. Now, that's <laughs> certainly do exhibit thermal fluctuations away from those directions. <laughs> so, let's, be, uh, 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 let's take a moment to really classify and then we'll look at lots of uh, uh, lovely examples. What are liquid crystals then? We can say that liquid crystals are states of matter that have no positional order, just like liquids. The atoms or molecules, I should say, don't mind where they are at all, but not quite. Sometimes they have a little bit of positional order, but certainly less positional order than uh, crystals. This means that uh, very often, if we take a snapshot, the molecules look like they're in a rather disordered configuration, like a liquid, at least if we focus only on their centers of mass. On the other hand, because the molecules in question are rather anisotropic, usually cigar-like, but sometimes rather like plates or dishes, uh, because of this additional degree of freedom associated with the orientation, these systems can show the phases of matter where although the centers of mass are moving about at random, the orientation show a preferred tendency or alignment. As I told you, these systems are typically uh, composed of rather anisotropic molecules, and we should think of them as roughly like cigars, and it turns out that there's a broad range of possibilities, many, many possibilities, I'll just show you a few of them. So that's what liquid crystals are. They're sort of intermediate, intermediate phases of matter somewhere between liquid and crystal. By looking at the least complicated of all examples of liquid crystals, and these are so-called <coughs> pneumatic states. They're called pneumatic because the Greek for thread is pneuma, and it turns out that these fluids have the property that sometimes there are faults in them, just like there are faults in crystals, but in pneumatic liquid crystals, form threads, and they rather look as if somebody's left a piece of cotton floating somewhere in the interior of the fluid, hence the name pneumatic. Now what did we have before? Before we had this collection of phases running from gas to liquid to solid as we cool the system down. What we find, for example, with this molecule PAA is not that, but instead, if we heat PAA up, what we find is an isotropic gas which, if we cool, turns into an isotropic liquid, a conventional sort of liquid. Okay. It suffers a phase transition into a new phase, which you see is an intermediate and it gets the name the pneumatic phase, and you see that this isn't astrophysical or high-energy uh, physics. This is in a very reasonable temperature range, something like between 118 degrees centigrade and 135, things that are quite reasonable to achieve in the laboratory. Now, what do we mean when we say pneumatic state? What we mean is the following. Suppose we focus on a little volume somewhere in the fluid, and that volume in this picture is supposed to be this little flat square here. <coughs> Suppose we ask, what happens to the molecules in the neighborhood of that box? Well, the system is a fluid as far as the center of mass is concerned, so if you focus on any one of these molecules, you'll see that its center of mass is a container, much like the center of mass of a roughly spherical molecule 
result in an ordinary fluid. <coughs> on the other hand, if you instead focus on the orientation, what you find is that although the center of mass is diffusing throughout the sample, the orientation is also diffusing, but it's only fluctuating around a, pr a preferred position. So that if we look at the orientations of the molecule in this little volume here, new molecules will come in and old molecules will leave, but typically, statistically speaking, the molecules will give a preferred direction along which they want to point. So there is some order molecules are pointing along a preferred direction, just like the uh, molecules might concern <coughs> crystals. On the other hand, with regard to the center of mass, there's no positional order, just like in a conventional fluid. So we refer to these phases as anisotropic fluids, fluids that do not regard each direction of space equivalently, because this fluid knows that the molecules like to come in and leave, pointing roughly along this preferred direction. So this is a new phase of matter, the so-called thematic phase of matter. Now, why is this uh, interesting from the point of view of the mechanics of these fluids? Interesting because we can ask, what happens if we take a sample of thematic and try to distort it? We want to ask the question, what happens when we apply stresses out of these samples we form? Now, what are these pictures, uh, what are these pictures intended to they're intended to represent samples of liquid crystal in the pneumatic state. And the dark lines here, the four dark lines, are not supposed to be the directions that the molecules are that are pointing along. Instead, the dark lines represent the preferred direction along which the molecules statistically point. So any one molecule at any given time might not be pointing along that direction, but if I average the orientation for some period of time, that's the average direction that I'll prefer. On the other hand, chopped through on the other surface over here is supposed to be the ends of the molecules. These are supposed to be cross sections of the molecules. The implication, at least intended, uh, to be that the molecules have complete randomness with regard to the locations of their center of mass. So there's no crystallinity with regard to the locations of these points. These points are moving and diffusing at the time. On the other hand, there is direction of orientation. Now we can ask ourselves what happens if we're able to grab hold of the sample and either splay the sample like this or twist it like this or bend it like this. And what we find is that in contrast to conventional fluids, these anisotropic fluids have a remarkable behavior in the sense that if we do stress them like this, then no matter how long we wait, we'll always find a restoring stress. These systems will never relax in the same way that the infinitesimal distortion of a perfect crystal will never relax and will always feel a restoring force. So with regard to distortions such as these depicted over here, these liquid crystalline materials are solid. On the other hand, if we make slightly different distortions, suppose the molecules are aligned roughly vertically and we try and twist, or suppose they're aligned roughly horizontally and we try and bend as depicted in this fifth picture here, then we find that the molecules are able to slip past one another and the stress is able to be relaxed. And so although when we initially make the deformation we might feel some restoring force, if we wait long enough that restoring force will completely relax to zero, just as it would with conventional fluid. <coughs> so this is in a sense the origin of the name liquid crystal. These are materials which for some purpose respond to mechanical stresses as if they were crystalline, and for other mechanical stresses respond as if they were liquid. So the name now let me look at, uh, let me show you just one or two more interesting examples. And the first ones I'll show you are the so-called smectic states, and they are exhibited, for example, by the molecule with the illumination of 10 bar S5, uh, depicted up here. So here's an example of 10 bar S5, and that molecule just happens to show the following kind of phase. If we go to high temperatures, it forms a gas, and at lower temperatures, it forms a conventional liquid. If we cool it down a little bit further, it gains orientational order and forms the pneumatic phase that we've been looking at so far. What that means is the centers of mass are completely disordered, but the orientations are, uh, are there is a preferred orientation. Now, something quite spectacular happens. If we cool this 10 bar S5 down a little bit more, 
it retains its orientation of order, but it develops some layer of order. And here's a depiction of that layer of order. The molecules now exhibit a density wave. There are preferred locations for the central mass. At least if we move through the sample in this direction. On the other hand, if we move through the sample in this direction, there's no preference for any particular point, and the system is essentially fluid-like with regard to the positions of the center of mass, at least in this horizontal direction. And that's called the smectic A, or, smectic, or layered A phase. Smectic referring to the layered nature, and A referring to the fact that the orientations of the molecules are perpendicular to the layers of the form. So this is also somewhere in between liquid and crystal. It's certainly not crystal because there's no three-dimensional ordering of the centers of mass of the molecules. And it's certainly not a conventional liquid because there's both orientational order of the molecules and some order in the centers of mass in one particular direction. Now, if you pull 10 bar S5 down a little further, something else happens. It forms what's called the symmetric C phase, which is layered and orientationally ordered, but the orientation is no longer perpendicular to the layers. So that's why it gets a new name, symmetric C, rather than symmetric A. So we've seen orientationally ordered system, and now we've seen both layered and orientationally ordered symmetric phase. Now there's only one more phase that we'll need to look at, and that's the so-called chiral pneumatic phase which will be important when we come to look at the liquid crystal display. The depiction of the so-called chiral pneumatic phase. How does this phase work? Well, it's essentially pneumatic in the sense that if I look in any particular sub-volume, I find a preferred direction that the molecules would like to point in. On the other hand, as I move through the sample, what I find is that, that, what I find is that preferred orientation as I move through the sample. That rotation has a handedness to it. The fact that it's handed is the reason for the word chiral or handed sitting in the type of these phases. Sometimes these phases are called cholesterics because the original ones were usually formed from derivatives of cholesterol, but generally speaking, we nowadays call them chiral or handed pneumatic. And what I've intended to depict in this figure here is the idea that in this region of the sample, Sample the molecules point up and down, but as I move across to this point, they roughly speaking point in and out of the board, then up and down, and then in and out. And if we plot the preferred direction as a function of space, you can see that that preferred direction for orientation is a vertical structure as I move through the sample. Where do these ones occur in terms of the phase diagram? Well, that's depicted down here. If you cool the sample down, it will undergo a transition from a conventional isotropic liquid to a chiral pneumatic state in which the molecules are rotating and orientation is ordered, although there is no traditional order. This particular type of liquid crystal, cholesterol mirror state, suffers a, another phase transition to the layer, A phase, down to a solid if you cool it down further. And it turns out that this sort of twisted state will be quite important at least uh, in a subtle way for applications of liquid crystal devices. So that's all I want to say about the kind of liquid crystal phases uh, that there are. In fact, there are many more. There are smectic A through K, we've just looked at smectic A and C. There are also all sorts of yeah, stars that have to their names, a broad variety, a, a whole duology of them. But I think that's probably enough for today. What we'll do now is see what happens when we actually apply various forces to liquid crystal. The first thing we might want to do is contain our liquid crystal sample in some sort of container. <coughs> and because the orientation is rather delicate, the orientation of the molecules in, let's say, the pneumatic phase is rather delicate, it turns out that it can be very strongly influenced by holding on to the direction that the molecules point in uh, with various types of surfaces. Um, this is a little bit like taking a ferromagnet and applying a magnetic field in a ferromagnet Often we have a whole family of possible orientations for the magnetization, and if we apply a small external magnetic field, we can select on the basis of the energy ground one of those particular orientations of the ferromagnet over any other. Something rather similar can happen here. It turns out that there are some 
uh, substrates or sample containers that have the effect of grabbing hold of the molecules and asking them to sit flat in the plane. There are others that ask the molecules to sit perpendicular to the boundary surface. The first go by the name of planar boundaries, the second homeotropic, and in fact there's a whole variety of others. And the study of these uh, phenomena associated with how the molecules interact with the boundaries goes by the name of anchoring of liquid crystals, and it's very important both in terms of basic research and industrial applications. Let me just mention that you don't have to do very much to contain it to make it have a profound effect on the liquid crystal molecules. Before I mention that, I want to emphasize that in fact, the surfaces are by no means holding on to the molecules and making them point in the preferred direction. It's a much more subtle affair than that. In fact, if you take glass plates and just gently brush them, you would introduce enough grooves at the atomic scale that when the molecules approach, they see this slightly rippled surface, and that slightly rippled surface is just enough to encourage the molecules nearby to point in the direction of the grooves. So it's by no means a locking of the molecules into the surface, it's just a sort of preference, which is enough to uh, force the whole sample direction. So, uh, because these fluids now have this degree of freedom associated with the direction of molecules, we can control them, even though they're fluids, by manipulating what happens to the system at the surface. Um, anchoring, and we'll need to think a little bit at least about planar anchoring when we come to build the crystal light. <coughs> That's what happens with mechanical forces. Let's ask what happens if we apply electric fields to next physical phenomenon that we'll need to understand in order to see how it is that liquid crystalline devices work. Let's imagine that we have a capacitor plate, a pair of capacitor plates, here they are, and let's suppose they're uncharged so that there's no electric field between them. Then a given molecule sitting between them, of course the scales are absolutely crazy here, the molecule is typically tiny, and the plates are wide, very, very widely separated on the scale of the given molecule. Then the molecule sitting between these uncharged plates in the absence of an electric field is quite happy pointing in any direction whatsoever. On the other hand, typically, if we charge up the capacitor and produce an electric field through it, then it turns out that the molecules have a preferred direction that they want to point in. And the reason is that it's far easier for the charge on the molecule to uh, separate a little bit. In other words, the electric field to produce an induced dipole moment uh, if the charge wishes to separate along the molecule compared with the charge trying to separate across the molecule. This is actually essentially um, a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle associated with excitations of the electronic state which basically have a smaller energy gap uh, in this direction than this direction. Uh, so in summary, the molecules like to point, roughly speaking, along the electric field so we can control the orientation of the molecules now both with boundaries and also with external electric fields. It should be emphasized that there are also molecules that carry permanent dipole moments, which respond more strongly to electric fields. And there are also molecules which happen, for reasons of their electronic chemistry, to prefer to point perpendicular to applied electric field. So, let's ask ourselves why it is that these electrical forces are they are for conventional phases. The reason is the following. If we focus on conventional gases and liquids, the thermal motion is so strong, the molecules are diffusing around so fast and bumping off each other so hard, that really the effect of an external electric field is rather minimal by comparison. And any ordering produced by the electric field is essentially wiped out by the thermal fluctuations. On the other hand, in solids, typically the molecules are locked into some preferred orientation, and so if we use an electric field, we can at best find some tiny little distortion, some tiny little response, but not really very much. On the other hand, liquid crystals are in a sense rather marginal. They are uh, willing to align under the influence of the field, and when they do align, they help each other all collectively align. The whole preferred choice of our orientation direction sloshes round and points with the electric field, and so they're really extremely <coughs> sensitive to applications and boundaries, and this is one of their primary virtues in application. So now we've seen what happens when we apply surfaces and when we apply electric fields, so we're learning how it is we can control 
Let's put those two physical phenomena together and have a look at the a beautiful effect known as the Friedrichs effect. What happens? Let's suppose we take a liquid crystalline sample, this one up here, and we put it between a pair of capacitors with no charge so there's no electric field, and let's suppose that we choose the boundary conditions, we choose the plates to be such that the molecules want to lie in a preferred direction, which happens to be the direction of their defeat. So we have planar anchoring and we have the same direction of anchoring top and bottom. Now, what happens when we apply a small electric field? Well, actually, essentially nothing happens when we apply a small electric field. And the reason is, molecules were going to respond to the electric field, they want to change their orientation. But if they did change their orientation, they'd be introducing gradients in the orientation across the sample, and that costs energy. The system doesn't respond. The system essentially sits in the same state as it was in before the field was applied. On the other hand, if we apply a strong enough field, there comes a time where the system says, well, at the boundaries, I better obey the boundaries imposed by the uh, uh, anchoring boundary condition. But in the middle of the sample, I want to gain energy by having my molecules polarized and pointing along the electric field. So I gain some volume energy. And I have to pay a certain price. And that price is the fact that the orientation is distorted from the crystal. So this introduces free energy. And there comes a time when the electric field wins over the conditions and the system snaps into this new <coughs> orientation, which is this inhomogeneous configuration. Orientation of the molecules varies as we move through the sample. This actually isn't much more than a refinement of the well known Euler strut in mechanics, where if I take a rigid strut and squeeze on the end, there comes a time when the system snaps into a curved configuration instead of the uh, straight configuration. This is a And we'll see later on that this particular instability, the so called Friedrichs effect, is one of the primary ingredients in liquid crystal displays, although in a slightly different guise. But what we need to do first is to understand what happens when we try and pass light through them. So the next ingredient of liquid crystal displays is the ingredient associated with light. So we better go back and just ask ourselves what is light and how does it interact with matter. Now, on transparency, I'm telling you something that you all know very well indeed. But light is a truly remarkable thing. It's an excitation of the vacuum. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, idea uh, in which uh, electric fields change in time and in doing so cause magnetic fields, and those magnetic fields change in time and cause electric fields, and together the whole affair bootstraps itself into this electrical wave which propagates through space. Now I've intended to try and depict such an electric field here light, in red is supposed to be the electric field as a function of position throughout, uh, the, uh, throughout the light. Perpendicular to that in the y direction is supposed to be a magnetic field. And this is a snapshot of so-called linearly polarized light. The whole construct moves at the speed of light in one of these uh, left or right across the sample. And so if I sit at a particular point, what I find is, as you all know very well, the electric field grows in a certain direction and shrinks along that direction and then grows in the other direction and then back, back to zero, and the whole process repeats itself. So that's what light is, but there's another brand of light, not this linear, linearly polarized light in which the electric field shrinks and grows along a particular line. We can also have so-called circularly polarized light, and that's depicted at the bottom here. If we were able to take a snapshot of the light, then what we'd see is this pattern of electric fields forming a, forming a spiral structure in space. And again, the whole spiral structure moves in space at the speed of light. And so if I sit at any particular point, what I now see is an electric field rotating as a function of time. And that, as you all very well know, is circularly polarized light. And what we'll need to do now is understand how it is that polarized light interacts with matter particularly when that matter consists of liquid crystals. Now, just before we do that, I want to mention just a little bit about polarized and analyzed, because we'll need this also. Let me just remind you that we can introduce in 
to the path of a light beam polarizers, one of which is typically called a polarizer and the other is typically called an analyzer. Now, what is the effect of these devices? Well, they have quite a striking effect. Suppose I have light heading in this direction. Doesn't matter what brand of polarization it is. Then, what I find is that the light emerging, if any does happen to emerge, is light that is polarized linearly in a particular direction associated with how we chose to configure the particular polarizer in question. We can either end up, for example, with light polarized in the vertical direction, or in a different configuration, we might end up with light polarized in a horizontal direction. So whatever comes in, what comes out is linearly polarized. And we'll need a pair of these objects in order to construct our little crystalline device. So those are polarizers and analyzers are something we all know something about. Now we talked we talked a little bit about light in vacuum. Now let's talk about how light actually interacts with matter. Let's imagine that we have some light, this blue light being here, this is being heading towards a surface between air or let's say a vacuum and some conventional liquid, let's say water. Now what actually happens? Well as we've seen, that light consists of electric fields with varying time. And those electric fields have the following effect. They grab hold of the molecules or the charges in the molecules in the surface and they jiggle them around. Now, as we know, jiggling charges radiate light themselves and so light comes out. But what happens is the light that comes out interferes in almost all directions in such a way to cancel out the radiated light except in two directions. One of those directions is and the other is this refractive beam down here. So what we see is that light interacts with matter in a rather subtle way, producing reflections and also producing refractive beams. And the angle at which the refractive beam moves through the medium is not just a, uh, an angle or direction that can be determined using geometry, it depends on the properties of the medium. That's what happens when light interacts with anisotropic, or excuse me, with conventional isotropic liquid. What happens if we have a liquid crystalline beam? Slightly different happens, and we have to worry a little bit more about the issue of polarization. Let's suppose we have air or vacuum up here, and let's suppose we have an anisotropic fluid down here, and what you're supposed to see here are the cross sections of the molecules that are being cut through to make a figure. The molecules are pointing in this direction. Now if we send light in, and if we have a mixture of different polarization states to do this what we'll find is, as usual, a reflective beam, whose angle of reflection is determined by geometry, not for kinematics, and we also now have two refractive beams, this one here and this one here. And they originate in the different polarization states of the incoming light for the following reason. If the light coming in was polarized out of the form, then when it grabs hold of the molecule near the surface, the molecules are rather susceptible and the charges can be sloshed around quite considerably. On the other hand, if the light that's coming in comes in polarized in this direction, then it's trying to move charges around across the molecule, and the molecule is rather narrow, and that's a very hard thing to do. So the way the charges are rattled around will depend on the polarization state of the incident light, and therefore the actual direction of the beam that emerges will vary according to which polarization state the incident light happens to be in. So we get two refractive beams, and this is the phenomenon of so-called double refraction or birefringence. This is called linear birefringence because it's associated with the linear polarization state of the incoming light. Now we'll need something related to this to understand how it is the liquid crystal displays work. Uh, but before we that, let's have a look and see what happens if we put a liquid crystalline sample between a pair of cross polarizers. So let's imagine that we have light coming in from over here, and let's suppose we have a polarizer which emits light linearly polarized in the vertical direction, and following it, an analyzer perpendicularly polarized light. Well, as you well know, if we put nothing in the K 
concavity between these two uh, polarizers, then what comes out is nothing. If you look from this end, the system will look dark because all the light will be extinguished by one polarizer or another. Now let's ask ourselves what happens if instead we insert some rather uh, random, uh, some rather random scramble of uh, liquid crystalline molecules, something that can be massive but not perfectly ordered, something that falls in between the polarizer and the analyzer. We want to ask ourselves what does the picture look like when we look in this direction to see if any light is coming through. Let's see what happens from here. dark regions, and you see light regions, and you see the dark regions are pitching off at crosses, and if we look carefully, the orientations of those crosses are rather consistent with one another as we move through the song. So what we'd like to do is understand why it is when we look at an emphatic little crystal that's a bit scrambled, rather imperfectly formed, through cross polarizers, we see this wonderful scrambled pattern. To understand that using concepts that we've already built, Let's do that as follows. Imagine now that we have our polarizer and our analyzer. Here's the light coming in over here. Here's the vertical polarizer and here's the horizontal analyzer. And let's suppose that the sample of liquid crystal is as depicted by this green blob. In other words, it's a liquid crystal that has a preferred direction that varies continuously around the sample and has a fault or a defect running along the axis cylinder. The reason for choosing this object is that it's an object that now has orientations of molecules that vary fairly smoothly as we move around the sample. Now let's ask ourselves what happens to the light that comes in through this system. First of all, imagine light coming in at 12 o'clock. That is light coming in somewhere along this radial direction. Now the light comes in and is linearly polarized in the vertical direction, and the only molecules it sees are molecules pointing in the same direction as the light. So that light will not be uh, dramatically influenced, let me say the polarization state of that light will not be dramatically influ influenced by the liquid crystalline medium. There's only one direction of molecules, and nothing very much can happen to that polarization state, and the light is vertically polarized and get extinguished by this cross polarizer. And so, on the 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock line, we essentially see nothing. Similarly, light coming in along the 3 o'clock to, uh, 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 to 9 o'clock line is light that comes in and has its polarization state everywhere perpendicular to the molecules. So its polarization state is also essentially unaffected by the presence of this anisotropic fluid. On the other hand, if we consider light coming in at, let's say, 10.30, somewhere along here, then the linearly polarized light will be encountering molecules oriented at an angle. And it's very useful to decompose that linearly polarized light with the light that's moving, uh, that's polarized parallel and perpendicular. Those two light beams will then pass through the sample at different speeds, and when they recombine, the other end of the sample, the linear polarization state will have been converted to an elliptical polarization state, and so typically we will find sunlight emerging through the cross polar. And for that reason, we essentially <coughs> see whitish regions uh, with these black ribbons pinching them off, just as we did in this. Yeah, and the question of bioprinters is associated with the fact that light polarization state is parallel to the molecules suffers differently from light whose polarization state is perpendicular to the molecule. So linear birefringence is responsible for this phenomenon, and later on we'll see that's actually what we really need for circular birefringence. So let's imagine now, and this really gets to the heart of the matter for devices, let's imagine that we have a piece of chiral that is twisted in the matter polarizer and analyzer. So here in green is the sample, and just sketched out a few planes of molecules. There's not supposed to be any layering order, but the preferred direction of the molecules is supposed to rotate, as you can see it does as you move through the sample. Now let's ask ourselves, what do we expect?
expect to see on this particular analyzer if we send in white light with all polarization states. So let's see what happens. This incoming light gets polarized, and because it has a handedness, the direction of the molecule spirals as we would do the sample, it's very useful to decompose this linearly polarized light into a pair of circularly polarized light bins, which add up to give a linearly polarized light bin. Now the left-handed circularly polarized light beam will travel with a slightly different speed because of the twist through the right-handed one will do. And because of that, by the time the light gets to the other end of the sample, left and right circular polarizations will all have their relative phases slightly changed and when they add up once again, light, what we end up with is light that now linearly polarized along a new direction. So, such light would typically at least be partially extinguished by this particular analyzer, except the degree to which the polarization state is rotated by passage through this uh, handed medium depends just a little bit on the wavelength of the light. And so it may be that for a given thickness of sample, one particular frequency of light will just so happen to have its polarization state rotated so as to be polarized linearly in this direction. And that light will be preferentially transmitted. And that's exactly what happens. And it shows up in the following figure. This is the so-called chiral hematic between cross colors. And what you see is you get a wonderful, strong, vivid blue, because it just so happens that it's the blue light whose linear polarization state gets rotated by 90 degrees or some uh, odd multiple. 90 degrees, so as to make it through the sample uh, and through the polarizer and the analyzer up the scale, whereas other colors are essentially uh, extinguished. And so the sample, even though it is made of white light, gives it a vivid blue color. That's essentially there. We have all the ingredients we need to make a liquid crystallized device, and this is how it works. Again, here's our picture of the liquid crystal display in so-called crystal pneumatic mode. What do we actually have? Well, at the top, we have a polarizer, and at the bottom, we have another polarizer, if you wish, an analyzer. We also have two transparent electrodes. Here's one of them in red, and here's the other. And they're going to play the role of capacitor plates. They're going to allow us to apply electric fields to the sample. They also happen to have been prepared bottom surface holds onto the molecules in the direction pointing out of the board, whereas the top surface holds onto molecules pointing in this direction. What this means is that even in the uh, no electric field applied, the molecules need to twist like a river coming down from the top surface to the bottom surface. Now, uh, if one just put an ordinary pneumatic in there and hoped that it would twist, one might suffer uh, faults because in some regions the molecules twist left, and in other regions the molecules would twist right. So typically one adds just a little bit of a molecule that has a certain handedness, so that when this system reaches equilibrium, it does so uniformly across the sample, twisting in a given way. Now, how does this thing work? In other words, what happens when we look from the top and ask ourselves what happens to light coming in from the top? Imagine light illuminating this device. It comes through the polarizer and gets linearly polarized in this direction. It makes it through the transparent electrode, and now it's handed medium, and because the medium is handed, the state of linear, linear polarization gets rotated. And we choose the materials and the thickness of the cell just so that when white light or light in the middle of the optical range comes it got rotated by just the right amount when it makes it through the polarized When it does that, it bounces off the bottom here, back up through the sample, and out through the top polarizer, having been re-rotated the polarizer. And the whole device, as you know, if you're looking at your pocket calculators, looks sort of silvery or mirror-like, because essentially what we're doing is looking one way or another at the mirror sitting at the bottom of the sample here. 
Now, if we want to make some sort of device, we need to be able to change the state. And the way we change the state is by applying voltage to the two electrodes. In other words, we essentially put the sample in a capacitor. What happens when we do that? Well, what happens is this Friedrich effect. When the electric field is just strong enough, the molecules snap. They don't break physically. But when I say they snap, what I mean is the orientation of the molecules changes. So instead of twisting smoothly in a helical way as we move from the top to the bottom of the sample, near the top of the sample they obey the top surface, and near the bottom they obey the bottom surface. But now, instead of just twisting, what they do is they tilt and try to point it on the electric field so as to gain the energy associated with putting an induced dipole into an electric field. Molecules align with the electric field. Now, what is the impact of this? The impact is that the light now coming in from above, polarized by the polarizer, goes through a sample that has much less handedness to it, much less twist. For a large fraction of the time it moves through the cell, the light is moving through molecules which are essentially pointing in the direction of light propagating, and so, we have, and so such liquid crystalline structures have rather little impact on the actual polarization state of the light. Because of that, the light that makes it to the bottom polarizer typically has roughly the wrong polarization to get extinguished, and so nothing makes it to the mirror to be reflected back up through the sample. And because of that, the sample typically, typically looks rather dark, instead of looking rather silvery, and that's exactly how we produce character with liquid crystal devices. So let me conclude by giving you, or showing you, just a small list of the kind of devices that I typically make. And here are some practical liquid crystalline devices. As you well know, if you just use seven separately controlled liquid crystalline elements here, what you could do is produce uh, all the numbers, at least in a fairly legible way, if you go up to 35 elements with this dot matrix away from the way and have each of these uh, separate elements controllable, you can also write uh, algebraic characters. You can also introduce color, and as you very well know, these devices have already found wide application in calculators, wristwatches, car displays, computer TV screens, and TVs, and all sorts of other things. Let me conclude. Roughly how it is that this crystal have been used in applications. Here's one that we all know very well. This is a laptop uh, liquid crystal screen uh, computer. And the great virtue is that one has no need for a bulky cathode ray tube in order to produce the screen on which to have their legible uh, character. So the liquid, the liquid crystal is very familiar. Slightly less familiar is this liquid crystal dashboard are essentially no moving parts, everything controlled electronically, and you can see a whole variety of pieces of information portrayed in a uh, fairly pleasant way. So we'll probably be seeing more liquid crystalline readouts in the cars. I'm not sure that the next one has any virtue to it, but if you should need one, you can have a handheld TV, a little color screen, again you avoid the need for a bulky uh, cathode ray tube and all the uh, powerful uh, electronic uh, structures that go with it. So there's the uh, portable color television. Uh, also, one can have so-called uh, optical shutters. Here's a nice example, maybe two pages ahead, I'm not sure, in my notes. You'll see here that we have three panels. Here's one, here's another, here's another. And essentially what we have here is electrical curtains by applying small electric fields, this is a slightly different liquid crystalline mechanism, but the idea is the same, a small liquid crystalline, uh, a, a liquid crystalline and a polymer system can be controlled using small electric fields to turn off the, or turn on the opacity of uh, various elements. In other words, we can have curtains without having curtains, we just turn off our windows or turn them on again. And this may ultimately be useful for having uh, shutters for cameras that have no moving parts, but the <coughs> response time of these systems is probably a little bit uh, slow for such processes. And lastly, in terms of applications, there are liquid crystals, as I showed you, that are handed, that have a twist. 
And it often happens that that twist occurs at a length scale or wavelength which is comparable to the wavelength of optical light. Now, it just so happens that the reflectivity of these systems varies strongly with wavelength in the vicinity of that wavelength, because you can imagine that light coming along might couple very strongly to the twisting molecules if their wavelength matches the wavelength of light. Now, it also happens with such media that if you change their temperature, it very often happens that the length scale or wavelength or pitch of the twisting molecules varies slowly uh, with temperature. And because of that, these systems change their color, change the color of light that they preferentially reflect as you change their temperature, so they produce rather gentle, non-invasive thermometers. This could be very useful, for example, you can spit a band of this <coughs> Child's forehead and see how their temperature or fever is changing uh, with time. You can also put liquid crystalline samples into various uh, uh, parts of an experimental apparatus and read off the temperature, at least with some degree of accuracy, by noting the color of the light uh, in the sample. So these liquid crystalline thermometers made out of pyrochromatics are also finding wide use. So that concludes everything that I'd like to tell you today. Let me just put up here a small number of books that you might find useful uh, as resources if you wish to investigate the crystals further. Thank you very much. Thank our speaker for a thoroughly edifying, exciting, and uh, refreshing talk on the crystals. And I trust you enjoy interacting with him uh, at dinner this evening. And uh, if we go on to the next session, perhaps just a quick standing break for just a moment, but realize that the next two papers in the session, which will be chaired by Professor Khan from SIU, are going to be on a subject which relates directly to this sort of thing, uh, gels and research project that
I apologize for the wrong. We have uh, tried different experiments with this room. One reason that this room is going to disappear by a bulldozer in a couple of years is that we have failed to solve the environmental problem. Um, when we turn on the heat, uh, we can't seem to control it. When we turn on the air conditioning, we can't seem to control it. Um, we open the doors here, a very loud buzzer goes. I'll see if I can ameliorate the situation, but thank you for your patience. Uh, I'll have some comments at the end of this session on the way to get to dinner. So hang in there. Thank you. Professor Cott. Thank you. Um, if you have noticed the abstract, it has two parts back to back, 15 minutes each. Uh, the first one by me and the second one by Kimberly. Rather um, than the chair of the session, I would like to do the following. You have probably seen music performances, one piano, two hands. I would like to give you one seminar to speakers. And if the chair permits, we will combine the two talks and provide one time. Uh, before I begin, I need to acknowledge some very important people. Eleanor Westman is a pure undergraduate institution, and we have only undergraduate students. Dana Deardorff, a double major in physics, mathematics, and probably art, too. Louis Bradshaw, a double major in chemistry and physics. Gary David, double major in physics and now in engineering, electrical engineering at Washington University. These are the three folks that have worked with me during the past 30 to 40 months. Everything you see here was done by the hundreds of your talking. And finally, the kind folks at NASA who support all this research through a grant. Tell them that I said thanks, Matt. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, I just want to share something with you which said in perspective what kind of a place we are. Because I'm kind of proud of who we are. At West End, we run, all of you have been to conferences or seminars that are organized. We have something called non organized. Non -organized. It's a forum in which faculty from all over the campus speak to faculty from all over the campus. And a few like Wayne Dolan, Alzheimer's disease of the vanishing mind, a link with portrait with the people, Church of St. Mary's Virgin, uh, autobiographies of the both Glasnost, fictions of the self, Nancy Lloyd, a professor of classics on Albert Emoting. Finding emotions through breathing and telephone and animal rights and so we have some animals and all over. I gave a talk at this forum and I put this up for the reason. That was the title of my talk. And so since Kimberly and I will be jumping back and forth for the next 25 minutes, that's my talk. Some of it, if it made sense to poets and philosophers and history professors, I'm sure all of you will appreciate it. And I say this
is because during the next 25 minutes, you may feel this is too simple. This is too easy. Well, you're all saying to yourself, this is too pretty, and this is too new and too cute. Why? Both and that about the uh, let's begin with one part of it, so that we'll be jumping back and forth. Let's begin with gentle robotics. Robotics means R2D2. Okay? The motor is worrying that strength. When you want to move things, that's what you do in robotics. A few years ago, folks at Toyota in Japan discovered a material which does the rather curious thing. Both the transparency is a material which plays between two electrodes and the scale of this figure that's clear from the crocodile clip on the edge. And you apply an electric field pointing one way, in it bends one way. You apply an electric field pointing the other way, it bends the other way. And you know what this is like. You apply an electric pulse, one will bend, then another pulse, it relaxes. The first material that behaves kind of sort of a little bit like a muscle, and the name artificial muscle. And in principle, therefore, to do this, apply an electric field up at some instant of time. Here, and at that instant, you flip the polarity. So it wants to bend in the other direction, and this is the time sequence of pictures. So we flip the feet, straighten it out, begin to bend in the opposite direction, and bend the other direction. Use the imagination just a bit more. Imagine this couple to a little plastic fish, and you hire an undergraduate student who keeps changing the polarity every now and then. And you've got a tail that drives itself. You've got yourself, in fact, a new way of propulsion. These go by the name of more mechanical engine. The whole thing is to go from chemical energy to mechanical motion straight without adding the pesky motor in the metal in the back. Okay. If this works, we would all be millionaires, <laughs> but we are not. There are three main problems. First, nobody really knows what's going on. And when you're as ignorant as when this so hard, only because it is so new. Second, I kind of cheated in that picture. Each frame there is separated in time by about half a minute. So it's a very lazy tail. It takes about 30 minutes to whack. What? <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, that particular material that you could see is visible. It's so gentle that all you have to do is go to it and say, Jesse helps us come and he dies on it. <laughs> And the solution that you saw in the tub is the name of the chemical is longer than I could pronounce even if you gave me a sentence in great. There is another family of materials which was discovered soon afterwards, where all this happens in good old H2O, where it is surrounded by this good old tank water. And we have developed some understanding of what's going on. So I just want to set this up and let Kimberly tell you what she thinks. Here being better, and you would measure 
big step that we did not confusion. Often we did strange, interesting things going on. Other very interesting things. Sometimes we would have our gel would bend into an S shape, or else if we switch the electric field instead of coming back to Bottom line is we have a very clear signature, squiggle of T, indicating diffusion and absolute blunt direct evidence. If you take the gel and put it on the side that has the convex curvature, put a drop of dye, and as the dye bends, you can see the gel going in. It literally is just that for some reason that we don't understand, the electric field causes differential diffusion forms on the two sides, it's like having a biomechanic trip. That it's not temperature, it's water going in on one side. And if it is diffusion and the electric field induced modulation of diffusion, we figure let us do some simple experiments to understand the diffusion properties of these materials absent of the electric field. Electric field, just put it in water and study its swelling properties. And that's the place where the second surprise comes. Second part of my talk is the central curve. Uh, I want to cut the story short to show you the results and then stop. How did you begin as we did with a cylinder made of this PDA stuff that you made? That's about the size of a quarter in about the same height. If you put it in water and come back three days later, you figure about three days. up into the cylinder at about that big, that uh, it's 90 some percent water, 98 percent water, and less than 20 percent of all my cash. You better dab it up. That's boring. What happened was when you put it in water and we didn't come back on Monday, then I came back on I think Saturday morning, and what you saw was it's not too visible. It is the background here. Also, another picture with a different contrast here, and I had an actual photograph. I do not know. I called a photographer in town who specializes in taking pictures of artwork. Went 
back and we have repeated this experiment a dozen times. I want to summarize what happened. Not to use the material. So there's the problem. So it's not sitting there. A short time early stage, it does this. I don't need to do this. That's like a few minutes. Two things happen. If you look at it, this is my cylinder. If I look at it from the edge, at early times, like two minutes later, the edge looks as if somebody has machined a gear to Very fine gear tool. And then as time progresses, the teeth on this gear become coarser and coarser. And at the same time, from the side wall, pattern begins to develop like that. At the later stages, <coughs> not try to describe that, but it does. You see? Those gear tools have become floppy, petal-like structures, and it's falling back down. Sometimes they don't even look that closely patterned like or orchid piece actually, but really patterned like the previous. A little bit later, in three days, back to a perfect cylinder. So much so that your initial cylinder had a slight defect in one corner. It remembers the shape of the last detail. If you had a little bend, be a volume 80 times bigger, but the dent is really big. And these stages are extremely complex. It's hard even to describe it. But nonetheless, they're completely reproducible. They are fixed. And they always get back to the same place. <coughs> the trouble is, physicists want a graph, something on y axis and something on x axis. How do you describe a thing like this to be with a graph? There's one aspect that you can. The early stage, when I say, you know, look at the ripple that forms on the edge. Year two structure. Just count how many waves there are in the ring and divide it by the length of the ring. You call that the wave number, the number of waves per meter. Okay? So the edge wave number can be counted obviously from the pictures and plotted as a function of time. First result, and since then we have a last one, but I want to show you the first one. It's amazing how sometimes one experiment will bar in the face. In square root, in the future. Physics of this thing is the essence is remarkably simple. The implementation is so hairy that <laughs> the professor at Washington University the Mechanical Engineering Department says this is worth two PhD comments and do this. Physics is simple. If water starts diffusing from the side, the edges get bigger. Circumference is not bigger than the radius is not. What can it do? Take that buffer. That's all it is. It's a material in which locally stresses develop because part of it is constrained on the inside and it is growing from different directions. In principle, you ought to be able to model that. The trouble is, it is the heaviest of what is called the time varying geometry. And that's where the result is. We understand there's a game execution problem, but we are in no position to mark somebody who is outstanding at modern 3D stuff. The last result, I don't want to spend more than one minute. Can I go ahead and do this? So the simple diffusion, that's so complicated. We want to do something even simpler. So the simplest geometry is that a very skinny fiber. Make it in the shape of a skinny rod so that you don't get all these complex patterns. And then the experiment consists of kinetic rods too. And just wait, put it in water, and take it out and wait. And plot the mass as a function of time. Every textbook, graduate, undergraduate in the world will solve this problem and say that the mass as a function of time will do a square root of t, will saturate. And the coefficient of square root of t gives you the diffusion coefficient. Three major problems. First, Kim has done this about 10 times by now. It will fit to a nice power wall, never a half. It's all 5, 6, 8, 6, 9, 5, 9, closer to 2 thirds than to half. We do not understand this. <laughs> Ultimate. 
mass uptake as a function of time. It begins with the first data point in the it. 0.8 grams, of which about 0.4 grams is polymer and the rest is water. Okay? So the backbone is like half a gram. And then you put it in water and it starts falling, falling, falling. It goes up to 24 grams. But instead of hitting an equilibrium, look at the one in the bottom. Over a period of about five times into the five seconds, this thing loses weight. All this time, it is surrounded in a bucket of water. So if you think of the potential gradient, the chemical potential gradient, outside is 100% water. But still, Not a little bit, but close to drop down one scale, drop down with 12 grams. It's almost like now stupid, but that's what it is. It's like a sponge just soaking up water and swelling, and then saying, I'm going to squeeze myself and push water back up. And we have crazy periods of bacteria chewing on a polymer. <laughs> Thank you. 
orientation as the previous slide, uh, segments being the lead off line. All the pictures that I'm showing you now, I downloaded from using the program Mosaic. Well, before the impact and before we knew what the effect would be, about how some were more dramatic than others, and it had not necessarily any correlation with how the 